Uh, let me repeat that. Um, yeah, welcome to the, uh, uh, the last bit of the course. Of, um, so we're going to tie up um, everything. Um, to, we're going to discuss these four things. Can you believe it's September? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, feels like March. Um, but uh, so yeah, I hope everyone's hanging in well. It's going to be a tough week. Um, I understand that. But uh, yeah, um, hopefully after this, you have a few more uh, relaxed days um, but, uh, to, until the final exam. So hopefully you can spread out your study load. and. Um, I will try to answer any concerns or questions you have about the mock or the final, um, or even the test at the end. So I'll start with uh, the main concepts first. Um, just one quick announcement um, first is uh, because of the, um, just the vastness of the course <laughs> with so many topics going on and also the shortness of the time of the summer session, um, uh, the, for the last part for part five, um, so these parts, three and a half lectures, anything in past uh, anything in part five about, ele uh, about magnetic force and um, electromagnetism, they will only be short answer questions in the final. Uh, so I will not include any open response calcul like full uh, five point um, open response problem solving type problem in the final as well as the mock. I think the mock I've said that already, um, but for both the uh, mock and the final, um, I will not include any open response questions. So all open response questions will be from uh, the first four parts of the course. Okay, so I hope that helps uh, a little bit. Um, there might be one short answer questions. Probably most likely is one of those left hand or right hand rules. Um, that those are the easiest, like two points or three points, you know, come up there. So learn those rules. Um, however, the homework um, is due. So the homework is like open response questions. So it's essentially, hopefully, um, in terms of learning, you still learn the material, um, but just release the stress a little bit for the for the final. I think that's only fair um, since it's such a big course, right? Um, you're welcome. I hope. Uh, yep. Will today's content be in the test tomorrow morning? Yes, unfortunately, um, but it will, everything should be wrapped up in the first uh, 30 minutes. Okay, all right, and then uh, you, so hopefully the first 30 minutes, I will cover these four things, um, and then the next hour, I will go and, and um, I'll probably focus on all the practice test five material first, so, so answer all your questions for test five and prioritize those, and then uh, we'll go from there and answer anything else if you have. All right, so uh, transformers, uh, that it, it, we have one key equation we'll need to learn today. I'll pop this up here first so um, you know what to expect. Uh, so this is the main part, and all, this also uh, latter part. And uh, P and the S stands for primary and secondary, okay? Um, so I'll just put this right here first right off the bat, okay? And um, yeah, uh, I'll explain what these things mean in the, uh, as we go. So um, also, I, uh, um, one, one extra term um, I really, Due to the shortness of the course, I really don't have time to do justice. But uh, hopefully, you see the idea of electromagnets is a really big deal in just real life. So um, I think I, I've gave you a couple, like three or four applications, including the northern lights or uh, velocity and mass spectrometers and um, stuff. But, or and even I casually mentioned picking up trash, picking up metallic trash to to recycle um, uh, for recycling. You know, to to recycle uh, alu aluminum um, or metals or any copper. You know, uh, you can make a magnet of that. But there are just everyday life. Uh, if you use some imagination and um, after the uh, course, uh, look around yourself, you can, you can see a lot of things used as electromagnet. This is just another example from a textbook about um, bells, about doorbells or any electronic bells. Um, you can have a spring load over here so that, um, uh, so that it's, uh, it, 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 it will, it's trying to pull the rod back and this iron rod will, um, it's going to be stick in here. But uh, as soon as you hit the switch, you close the switch, this generates a magnet. If it is an iron, it will immediately suck it um, into the magnet because this is a neutral piece of iron. Um, and then if you create a magnetic field here, um, it will go against the spring and then um, suck it into here and ring the bell. Right. So um, many, many applications uh, as we see. All right. So let's start. Uh, first thing is, uh, let me um, tie the, together the two laws we learned yesterday. Um, this uh, into, into one, you can sort of combine them and write them in what? in one single line like this. So there's Faraday's law, which tells us if you have a rate of change, if you have a change in magnetic flux, you will get an induced EMF. Okay? And the induced EMF is proportional to the rate of change of flux. So the faster you change the flux um, and the more dramatic you change the flux, you'll get a larger potential difference in your loop. Um, just a recap of the theory, you can, you can make a loop like this, right? Um, but let's, now that you've understand the basic, I'll make it a little bit more realistic. Um, so the loop is not a complete loop, but it actually spins off um, uh, so that the current have a chance to flow in and out of the loop. You place that inside some magnetic field. It's not a good loop. So you put it in some magnetic field like this. 
which can easily be made out of a north and south pole of the magnet and uh, connect the rest over here to, let's say, a light bulb or a capacitor if you want to store the electricity or just any appliance, right? So you have a area here, um, let's say, uh, so yeah, so, so the, there's actually flux going through it, right? So um, the magnetic flux as we introduced last time is defined as basically B times A, but it, you have to take into account of the angle as well, right? So this is identical. Either way, these two are completely identical ways of writing things. Um, it's, so either way is fine. Okay? This is more elegant from a mathematical point of view, obviously. Um, but yeah, if you want to make it a lot simpler, that's what it means, right? It takes into account of the angle because if the, if the plane, if there's no field actually, if it's oriented at an angle that there's no field going through it, there's no flux going through the loop. So if you are able to change either the angle, the area or the, magnetic field strength, remember B without the vector sign stands for magnetic field strength, like electric field strength, right, the magnitude of it. As long as you're able to make one of, any one of these or all three, but just to keep your life simple, right, time dependent so that it actually changed either this or uh, the, a, the area that it cuts through or changes as a function of time or the um, angle changes as a function of time, anything changes as a function of time, you will be able to set up a potential difference across the one point and another point. So as far as the light bulb is concerned, it almost thinks that it is connected to a battery. Okay, it's almost thinks that it's connected battery. Um, I will draw it like this uh, because in, in a moment I'll explain um, whether it thinks it's an AC battery or a DC battery, an AC power source or a DC power source. Right? But as, as far as it's concerned, um, as long as you are able to change the flux inside here, if you're able to make the flux change as a function of time, then you'll be able to provide um, a potential difference and induced EMF. It's almost like a battery, but it's induced from here, right? As soon as you have induced EMF, then um, you can calculate the current. Remember the current is always most dependent on whatever you put in the circuit. The more resistance you put in the circuit, the smaller the current will be. The current is very dependent on how much resistance you apply in your circuit, okay? Um, yeah, all right, so, so that's Faraday's law. Lenz's law tells you that which direction it goes, right? So Lenz's law tells you the direction of the uh, induced B field um, that comes from the induced uh, EMF or induced current, right, will always oppose the change in the external flux, in the external flux, okay. So if, if you suddenly, let's say at first there's no flux going through, you turn off the B field completely and then you slowly uh, increase the B field. So you gradually turn it on. So the flux through the area, I, this is not very 3D like, but hope, uh, assume it's the, the area is perpendicular to the field, right? So, so um, now you gradually turn on the B field so the flux increases. What the direction of the current, so does it flow this way or that way, right? So it will, the Lenz law basically is an observation. Remember law is just historical observation facts that people don't know how to explain it, right? Um, uh, the, it is observed by Lenz that it will go in a way that whatever the induced B field, right? So you'll get an induced current or induced EMF, right? It'll, it will generate an, in, in, any current will on itself. So distinguish what is external and what is sort of induced out of it. So as soon as you have a current, you'll get an induced um, current out of it uh, that, will, um, that, that, that will create an induced B field that opposes that change. So if the external flux gets larger, it will generate a way that it opposes it. Um, if the external flux gets smaller, it will try to go in a way, um, it will, the current will go in a way that supports it, okay? Because the whole idea is, um, think of it as uh, electromagnetic inertia. Do you guys know what inertia means? Um, pop in the chat uh, if, if anyone doesn't know what inertia means. Okay, inertia in short, inertia is the resistance to change. Um, so when you wake up in the morning and you get out of bed and you don't want to, that's inertia. <laughs> um, more physics wise is uh, uh, if you have an object over here, it, 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 if it's not moving, it, it wants to stay at rest, right? It doesn't spontaneously move. Also, inertia applies to moving objects. Newton first law basically tells us if you have something that is moving at a constant velocity, it doesn't want to change either, right? It's almost like if you're doing, um, if you're in the workout and you're in the zone, you don't want to change, you want to keep going on. So that, that is inertia. So like um, the momentum. Um, in fact, uh, inertia, believe it or not, it's one of the deepest mysteries in physics. We still don't know why things have inertia, like why things don't want to change. Right? So what I described is mechanical inertia and a little bit about psychological inertia in our life. Um, but uh, the first one about uh, objects want to maintain its motion or uh, whether it's at rest or maintain its velocity, that's mechanical inertia. And then there's the um, electromagnetic inertia. So electromagnetism has inertia as well. So at first, um, let's say you don't have any B field going through it. So there's no flux going through it. Um, 
then the, the wire is completely happy. It's completely satisfied with no B field going through. Now, when you suddenly increase the B field, it becomes very unhappy, it becomes very uneasy, and it tries to create a current so that it creates a, its own B field, right? It's induced B field to try to oppose whatever's going on. In the second case, so that's case one. In the second case, if I decrease the B field, external B field, so the flux, let's say originally there's a lot, like now, now that the, the wire is all caught up, <laughs> um, it has the B field going through and it is, okay, finally settled in the zone of, okay, I have a B field going through me, all right, that's good. Um, now you certainly decrease it, it doesn't like that as well. It's tries, it will try to create a current that maintains the amount of B field. So let's say this is, uh, the B field is pointing to the right, um, which I guess to, with the zoom, it's gonna be that way. Um, so uh, if the cur uh, if a field is going to the right and suddenly you turn off the B field or you turn it off very slowly, right, gradually turn it off, the wire is not going to be happy and it's going to create an induced current that makes its own B field to the right to, to maintain its original um, amount of magnetic fields in that way, right? So that is that. So now uh, people can sort of combine these two ideas of uh, Faraday law addressing what is the magnitude of the, um, so you can calculate the induced current out of this, the magnitude of the induced EMF or the induced uh, current, um, it's basically proportional to this, um, whatever constant you, uh, it, uh, it's basically um, due to convention. Um, however, it's actually easier just to make it one. Uh, um, you can define, basically that defines what Tesla, the unit of Tesla is. And uh, this is Lenz law on this side, right? So the Lenz law addresses the fact that whatever induced is opposing the external. So people just combine it in one sentence with a minus sign over there. The minus sign is not taken that seriously. There's no sense of sort of negative uh, magnitude. It's really just a mnemonic to remind ourselves that um, the direction of the induced current is in such a way that it ex opposes whatever is the external change in B field. Okay. Uh, question clarifying that not a negative in front of the ex uh, external. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in fact, I just uh, addressed this. So, yeah. So that negative has no calculational significance, no algebraic significance. It's really to encapsulate this idea together. Um, so this people will quote it as Faraday lens law, just to get us, right? So one ingredient addresses the magnitude of this and one ingredient addresses the direction of this. All right, um, which brings us to uh, AC generators. Let's uh, analyze a little bit more um, how power plants work. So if I have a magnet like this, right, going from north to south and I put a, uh, this time I put a square loop through it, so it's a little bit easier. So this is the top view, um, but it's probably easier to look at it from the side. Maybe I'll use a separate page. So if I look at it from the side, from the side view, um, the let's say the, um, the loop, the current loop, right? So you're looking from the side like this, is like this, sort of the plane of the loop is parallel to the B field. Okay. So at first, what is the flux going through this loop? Can someone tell me what is the flux going through this loop? Let's say this is initially, and then now you flip it up. What is the flux through uh, case number one? Very good, zero. So if the uh, loop is in the plane of the fields, no fields is actually cutting through it, right? Um, the word cutting is sometimes we use that as a metaphor uh, for it. And now you rotate it. So I'm rotating it like this, right? So the first step, I'll rotate it 90 degrees. Now there's a huge flux through it, right? So at first in state one, there's zero. And then now uh, if it's 90 degrees, um, say state number two is B times A, simply B times A, where A is the area of this loop, right? Um, you, so technically, um, right, this is B A cos theta. And what, what's changing is B is not changing, A is not changing, is the theta, uh, the, the angle between them that is changing. Um, in terms of area vector, you can also account for that. Right? This is the original area vector, A1. And uh, in, in uh, case number two, right, after you rotate it, this is the area vector. Right? It's a perpendicular vector this way. So first you see it is, the B vector is just constant, and right? it's just going, doing its thing, going from left to right. Um, at first, uh, A1 is perpendicular to this. So with the cosine, um, it's going to be zero. And then here with the cosine, it's going to be one. Right? So now you've got to increase in, flux, right? So what happens, right? So in this process, the flux increases, which means there will be an induced current, right? So you have an induced current uh, will flow and uh, so it will flow and which way will it flow? It will flow in a way that opposes the increasing flux. So it'll try to flow in a way um, that decreases the flux. So um, if I use um, green, right? 
Now, the, so remember, at first, there's no flux going through it. Now, there's flux going through it to the right. It's not going to be happy. So it is going to try to create its own B field, B induce, that opposes the external B field. So this is the B beta external. And how, uh, which way does this loop have to, um, does the current have to go in order to create this green B field? It must, um, it's your right hand. So it must go, uh, the, the current must go in here and out here, right? It must rotate in this direction. Okay. So if you're, again, whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise depends on which way you're looking at. Are you looking from the left or looking from the right? Let's say you're looking in from the right, from the south pole direction, then it's gonna go um, clockwise. Like that, yeah. But it's easier to just mark uh, where it's going in and where it's going out. And then now, as you keep turning it, let's say you turn it another ninety degrees, so back to state three, there is no um, flux again. Now the flux decreases in this step, right? The flux decreases. So the current again, um, you will get a as long as the flux change, as long as you have some change in uh, flux, you will get a current. But with this time, it will go in a way that supports the external field, right? Because it, it's decreasing and it's not happy. It wants to, it wants to maintain that. So it's going to go in a way that um, supports the, the external field, right? Um, because it wants to oppose the decrease in external field, right? So it's going to generate its own uh, B field. So let me use yellow this time. Um, so this time, as, as it goes, um, as, it, as it tilts sort of uh, halfway, maybe let's draw a new one goes from here to here, and ultimately to here. Um, but it's easier to just draw it halfway first. Um, it wants to create a field in, in this direction, right? Um, the, but it's tilted, so it has to create a uh, induced field in this direction. But it, it wants a component, right, that uh, the X component to, to be in support of the external field like that. Okay? Um, because if it, if it induces something like this, um, this component doesn't help the external field at all. But now this component is just opposing it, so that's not the right way. Right, so it wants to create a B field in this way so that it supports the decrease in flux. Right? So how do you achieve that? Then you need to um, have the field go uh, in here and so right, in here and out of here. Right? Do you agree? In order to induce a B field that points this way. Right? because the external flux is going to decrease as it goes from here to here. So notice the current changes sign, the induced current flips. Before the top was uh, in and here is out. Now this is in, this is uh, out. So um, you, what you see is, is as you rotate this, if you have, a, if you have your pet um, cow uh, tied and ask your cow to walk in a circle and, and, and get this spinning, the current you produce with half of it will be going one way, and then the second half of the rotation will be going the, another way, right? So what type of currents are you producing, direct or alternating? You'll produce an alternating current, right? So that's why most power plants you see today generates alternating current that goes into your household, right? So um, remember, this is the flux um, formula. And uh, if you differentiate that with respect to time, you'll get something like this. Now, this is just how fast it is rotating, right? It's the amount of angle per unit time. So this is called angular speed, angular velocity or angular speed, velocity. Now, let's say it rotates, you know, at, um, at 30 degrees per second, it's like that, you know, that can be a constant unless your cow starts speeding up and slowing down. Let's say your cow is well-trained and it's going in a constant speed, or you, have, you put this at under a water mill or a windmill that is spinning at a constant rate. It doesn't have to be constant, but just for simplicity, let's say that's constant. The only thing that is changing, so that's usually called uh, omega. Um, some professors used to joke, the difference between going to a college and a community college is in one you call this W, in the other you call it omega. So that's where your money's worth is. <laughs> uh, so you have uh, E A omega sine, so everything here is a constant. The only thing that depends on the time is this. So you see, what is the, if I try to plot the um, induced um, EMF, it's going to look like this right, in the sine curve. Uh, so the flux through it, you see um, the flux follows here, the external flux through it follows a cosine like this. Right? So at first the flux is, um, well, it depends on where you start. Uh, if you start off at uh, here, then it's going to be zero. So maybe I should shift it. But anyway, maybe this is 0.2, and then here is 0.3. Right? So let's say this at that point, the 
the included angle between the A vector and the B vector is zero, right? So here the included angle between it, the angle included angle as a function of time is zero degrees. Here it's 90 degrees. Uh, here is 180 degrees, yeah, 270 and 360 degrees, right? The whole rotation. How does that map over here? So at first here you will, uh, this is the induced current or induced EMF, right? The, the relationship between this is just to, by a factor of R. Um, so uh, if one is, if one is goes as long as a sine, the other is also a sine, right? If one is cosine, the other is also cosine. Yeah. So um, you see the first 180 degrees. So from this point to this point, uh, it will, the, the current is flowing in one way. The current is flowing in, in the positive direction um, and the other is flowing in the other way, right? So that's why you get that alternating current. So you get alternating current or AC. Okay. So uh, you can see this is the diagram, right? You, uh, in, also, you want to include some slip rings over here. So remember, this side is completely connected to this ring. So as you rotate it, uh, this ring rotates with this wire. And uh, the other wire over here connects to this slip ring. So as it rotates, these rings rotate as well. Um, and this is not touching, right? The, the, the inner ring is just connected to one side of the wire. So yeah, so it will produce a current going this way and then half of it will produce a current going the other way. You will get alternating current and a typical um, generator rotates around 50 to 60 Hertz, which means it flips around uh, 50 to 60. Actually, it doubles because, um, uh, because you see, uh, in one uh, complete rotation, um, right, sorry, uh, the, the current flips that much, but if you analyze the power going through the bulb, right, that's the current through the bulb and uh, voltage through the bulb, sorry, voltage across the bulb. So if you have this uh, generator over here and you have a bulb over here, what, really you, what you really care is not really which way the current goes or the uh, potential difference, even though let's say this is the induced EMF from your generator. So this is the same as what you experience in the bulb. Um, what you care is the, um, because this flips back and forth, this flips back and forth, it's very difficult to analyze both at the same time. So let's rearrange it in another way that is easier to understand um, because the resistance of the bulb is always constant. That's to do with the material, right? So you need to square it. So that means uh, if you square it, if you get a, if you, if this is following a sign, right, you square it, it will look like this. So in 360 degrees, it actually flips up and down twice. Okay. So you actually get 120 Hertz. Uh, you don't need to really know these numbers, but just to get, give you an idea of the number in real life, um, how, how much it flips back and forth. So if you look at any light bulbs, they actually flip around this much um, uh, from 100 to one per second, that many times uh, per second goes sort of on and off. So uh, our eyes don't really catch that. It's impossible to catch that. Um, it, to give you a reference, right? If you watch a movie, movies are filmed in 24 frames per second. So that's 24 Hertz. Um, already you look at, you watch a YouTube video, um, YouTube videos are around like 30 Hertz. Um, if anyone's into video editing, um, you might know these numbers. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so you already think that's continuous motion. So with hundred Hertz, that's you just think that the light is completely turned on. Right, so this is the P max. What you sort of get is the a P average over here because Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. So what you really get out of it is P average. So to be a little bit more technical, it's, you're actually getting the root mean square average of it, um, but that's a little bit beyond our syllabus. But, so just get a rough idea of how this works. Now a DC generator needs to be a little bit more clever if you don't want this to go on and off, like sort of flip the current back and forth. Then what you want is to sort of split this ring in half. So um, the moment it goes, start going the other way, when the current starts flowing the other way uh, because of the induction, uh, of the electromagnetic induction, um, then this will flip the, uh, this will, this will connect to the other side, so it flips it back. So what you get is instead of a induced current that goes like this, it will, because of the connection, it'll bump whatever, yeah, because it, it'll flip it to the other side as well. So now your current is only flowing one way. It'll still, it'll still go from high to low, high to low like this, that you cannot prevent, right? Because it's a cosine uh, feature of the, of the thing, right? Yeah, so, so yeah. Um, so that's how you make an AC generator. That's how you make a DC generator. What does this have to do with transformers? Um, now, let's put this together. Uh, let's say I have a coil, which I'll call the primary coil. And I'm going to put a secondary coil, let's use orange, right through it with different number of turns. Okay, so the primary coil has n uh, p number of turns and the secondary coil has an s amount of turns. Okay, I'll overlap them together. Now here, let's uh, turn on, put it, to a, put it to a battery and turn this on. 
okay? And as soon as you turn it on, right, remember you will get a magnetic field going through it. Right? So um, depending on the direction I draw, I'll just make it simpler. I'll, I, I'm not sure if I've drawn it the right way, but you, you get the idea. You'll get a magnetic field going through here, so technically it wraps around as well. For now, let's forget about the edge effects. We'll focus on in the middle because that's what the, the orange one, the secondary one, experience as a flux, right? So if you turn it on, it, uh, at first, uh, step number one, um, there's no flux through the orange one. Right? And then step number two, when you turn it on, now there is a flux through it. So there is a change in flux. Right? So what will happen? You'll be able to induce a current through here. Again, I don't know which way is supposed correct, but um, yeah, you'll get the idea that it'll um, just as a, I don't want to draw that. I don't want to commit myself to the direction. Um, so you, from step one to step two, you will get an induced current. Now, how much current will you get? Well, for one loop, you will, so for each loop, you will get this much, right? Depends on how much the flux changes per unit time from the, from, so this is from B1 times the area two, right? Uh, I've made it so that they are, the area and it's always, the flux is always crossing it at 90 degrees. So it's just B times A, but the B actually comes from, from, uh, from one, right? One is controlling the B field and the orange one, the secondary one is just experiencing the B field created by the electromagnet of number one. Okay, so that's why I'm coloring it this way, right? But if you have NS number of loops, then the total you experience, it's going to be that much, right? Of a single loop, right? So NS amount, right? So you're going to experience this much. Again, remember the flux is from number one times the area of two. Um, and also, uh, how, about, uh, how about B1? Well, what is B1? B1 is, uh, treat this as a very long solenoid, right? treat it as an infinite solenoid, then you will get mu naught n uh, i, which is mu naught n primary of uh, the length of the primary coil, right? the current of the primary coil, right? That's the amount of magnetic field, right? So uh, you can see that the larger the ns, the larger the potential difference, you can generate out of two, total out of two, out of the secondary coil, okay? So it, whatever voltage you start over here, let's call that V1. I rarely write things without a delta, but this is an exception because the formula looks slightly more elegant. But, um, you can create actually a different voltage out of here, right? Uh, you can call it primary and secondary or one and two, whatever, right? So what is the ratio? Um, I, because this is a beginner's course, I won't derive it, to, it for you, but you can go through the math and then you can figure out this is the ratio that comes out. So if you have, let's say a thousand turns in the secondary coil, and let's say you have 10 turns in the primary coil, then you can actually increase the, so you can increase the second voltage a hundred times of the first primary voltage. So this is called a transformer. It's a device that allows you, the wording is called stepping up or stepping down. It basically allows you to, a device to increase or decrease. So it's called stepping up or step down the voltages. Okay. So whatever you create, you can create, start with something with um, five volts. Let's say you start with something with five volts, buy a battery and then put it, um, run it through a transformer and you can get 500 volts out of this. So this is a very interesting device. So a little bit more realistic ones. Um, don't sort of overlap them like this because it's, um, uh, th there's a better way to do it. Um, that's an engineering problem that we won't go through it too much. But what you want to do is um, put a piece of iron over here like this. So this is just some uh, iron or some metal. Because in one side, when you create the um, magnetic fields, the iron will actually guide them along here and sort of reduce the edge effects and sort of contain everything in here. So the magnetic field goes through like this. And um, the magnetic field will try, there will be some leakage outside here, but if you have a piece of metal, um, the metal atoms, again, this is like beyond our syllabus, but you can sort of intuitively imagine that the, the atoms in the metal will sort of just force the field to go along with it. So you can put it like this, all right? And to notice what type of input do you need? You have to, do a alternating current input. You cannot use a DC input because if you have a DC input, the moment you turn it on, yes, there's a change in flux, right? Because this side is gonna be connected to a light bulb or something, right? This side is gonna be your generator. If you use a 
if you use a, a DC one, the moment you turn it on, good, there's a change in flux. It went from nothing, no flux, to lots of flux. But DC will start to make a, make a constant field. It's not going to change. So you need an AC so that um, your current here goes back and forth, right? Your current here changes, which means your magnetic field goes back and forth, which means your flux through the number two, right? the, the flux through number two is going to change in time. So the current has a fighting chance Right, the EMF has a fighting chance to get induced some current or EMF on this side. Right? So as you can see, this is another reason why AC is so much more useful in the real world, even though at first when you learn about it, it looks very flip-floppy <laughs> going back and forth, but this is the important part. All right? um, also, uh, but what's it, at first you might think like, wow, am I getting uh, power for free? Because if I can increase my voltage, it looks like for every second, remember power is uh, energy per unit time, right? For every second, I'm going to get more energy uh, if I can increase this. Um, that's not true <laughs> because um, if you think carefully, uh, the, what happens is when the voltage increases, there is a conservation of energy. The, the current is going to be smaller this way. Okay, so there's a, a conservation of energy. To, um, uh, so uh, I, I1, V1 has to equals to I2, or I primary, V primary has to equals to I secondary, V secondary. So um, if you have VP, Vs over VP, um, we arrange this, you can see that this is inversely related this way. So this is called the um, transformer equation, or equation for transformers. Okay. Um, usually I will rearrange it this way because um, usually we're more interested in the voltage. But just understand uh, the other part is due to conservation of energy or conservation of power. Um, uh, to no, so there might there could be a question to ask you um, if I give you how many turns over here, how many turns? Um, what is the new current? Then you use this side. If it asks you for the new voltage, you use this side. Okay. Now uh, this brings us to um, power lines. How do power lines work? And you probably have seen these danger signs and tell you that whenever you have uh, these transmission lines. Um, they are high voltage, right? They'll say like danger, it's a high voltage. So what's happening is in a power plant, you, you generate power and what they do is they step it up uh, extremely, to extremely high voltage and then step it back down um, uh, on this side, use a step down transformer. So you just have to, um, oh uh, yeah, I should mention, um, so obviously if you want a, a step up transformer is when V secondary is larger than the V primary, right? A step down is when V secondary is smaller than the primary. Okay. Uh, that, that also means that you need the number of coils uh, to be larger in the secondary or the number of coils to be smaller in the secondary if you want to step it down. Okay. So that's sort of the condition to, uh, to create whether a stepped up or a step down transformer. So um, yeah, so this is the, and then you step it down back to 240 because most appliances work well in 240. Okay. Um, in fact, you're, uh, so you might be curious, why, uh, why do we want to step it up? There's two reasons. Number one, it's actually safer. And number two, it's more efficient. Power efficient. Now, it might seem counterintuitive for the safer because you see all these dangerous signs saying that um, there's danger, it's high voltage. But uh, you might be glad to know that high voltage is safer than high current. Um, remember, there's a conservation over here, right? So you can, if, no matter how, if, if the power plant, power produced, is certain amount. If you step this up, this will go down, right? If you step this down, this will go up. So um, you, you can't get more power out of whatever power plant you create. Um, it's just a choice of do you want to make it, it when you transmit it, do you want to transmit it with a high voltage and low current or a low, uh, low voltage and high current? Um, there's, a say, there's a saying, say, uh, voltage shocks, but current jo uh, jolts, I think. I might have to Google that. <laughs> voltage shocks. Oh, current kills. Um, what, uh, because what's, if you touch it, I'm not going to go through too much of the biology here. Um, first of all, I'm not an expert, but uh, uh, you can, it's also short on time. So you can uh, Google uh, a little bit more understanding of that. Um, if you have a high current going through your body, um, it, it, that is very fatal. It will, basically, your heart also works with electric current. So if you have a high current going through it, you disrupt that completely and you stop your heart. Now, voltages, if you have, if you have 240 volts, um, so if you're touching, um, uh, the, um, yeah, so, if you are um, standing here and you touch both sides and you have a potential difference across you like this with 240 volts, but you only have like 0 0.1 amps going through you, it, it might be a little bit painful, but it doesn't, this, what, what stops your heart is this, okay? 
um, this will probably create pain. <laughs> that will that that's why you'll get a huge shock. But um, if you have a low current, imagine if you have if you have a very very low current, um, that's not going to do much to you, right? It, um, yeah, so, so that's one reason why you want to reduce the current. It's actually for safety. Right? It might be highly painful. Actually, if it's that high, it will probably burn you alive as well. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but still, at least it doesn't stop your heart. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, and you step it down, it's a 240, you know, it's somewhat safer there. All right. But more importantly, that's not really the main reason, although that's one reason. Um, th this is the main reason for power efficiency. So every line has some sort of resistance, right? Every real wire is not ideal. They will have some sort of resistance. All right, so resistance of the line. So what do you want to do? So you want to minimize the power consumed, the power loss, right? The power consumed in the lines. Well, that's to do with the current of the line and the voltage of the, the potential difference between um, this side and this side, right? Um, we don't really know what this is of the lines. Um, so let's rewrite it in this way. Then I do know what, um, I do know what uh, this is, right? This is some sort of number. So if you want to reduce, so what you want is to minimize the power consumed or power lost in the lines. To minimize that, you basically want to minimize the current. Okay? So this is why we prefer extremely high voltage through the two points. Um, and reduce the currents. Okay, all right. Um, so th uh, this is pretty much it. Um, although I'm running as a little bit, um, I want to end with a little bit of um, history of this as well. It, it's a very important phase of history that I think um, uh, I sh really should bring it up. It's later on now. It's co uh, coined the War of the Currents or the Currents War. It's really the struggle between AC and DC. How many of you heard of Thomas Edison? Okay, actually, maybe I'll put in the new slide. How many of you heard of Thomas Edison? And how many of you learned that he was a hero <laughs> in elementary school or something like that? In, if you know the actual history behind it, it, this is one of the biggest complete, excuse my language, complete BS in the history of science. Um, <laughs> Edison is probably the probably the most overrated um, scientist or uh, um, engineer in in the modern history of science. Um, he, what basically he did was um, there's a huge competition when all these were new between AC and DC. When all these theories were new, um, uh, basically Thomas Edison um, was one of the first person who made a DC generator. Um, so uh, uh, he was a big champion of this side of of the, the story and uh, Tesla invented a lot of, Nicholas Tesla um, invented a lot of the, uh, he invented first AC generator, etc. So which one's better for the world? Well, um, well, you probably know the answer here now, <laughs> and, um, given uh, yeah, uh, what we live in. Uh, but uh, back then, they, they don't know. Um, Yes, he did. <laughs> uh, so the, the prob if you know, want to know a little bit of background, Tesla is a, uh, comes from not a rich family, um, probably a middle class family. He has some amount of money, but most of his inventions, he's basically an inventor um, at heart, a scientist and an inventor at heart. Um, and he just he found a lot of uh, people to fund him to do his research and stuff like that. And uh, he's very accurately described as an inventor more. Um, whereas Edison is basically, he came from an upper class family. He has the richest background. Um, if you ever heard in elementary school how, you know, we, if you, they, they rate him as a as a hero of um, of um, of inventing the light bulb, which is true, he did invent the light bulb. That's good. Um, and it, praising his uh, work et, um, ethnic of uh, trying again and again, um, that is true. That is all. That is all good. Um, uh, but you might ask, where does how did he get like that thousand number of light bulbs to start with? That's because he was extremely rich. He came from a huge family. He has lots of corporate ties. Um, and uh, as they as they mature and then they develop their own company, um, Tesla has its own lab. Edison has its own General Electric company. Um, uh, he, so he tried to, um, of course, champion his own theory, which is fine. Um, well, there's also incident that uh, Tesla actually went to work for him for a while and then uh, Edison didn't pay him at all and, um, and stole all his invention. But uh, the worst part is, um, as the world starts to see more and more benefit with the AC, first of all, as I mentioned, if to, to use a transformer, you have to use AC. DC, if, if you use DC, you have to keep switching the, flip on, the switch on and off to create a changing flux, right? Because DC doesn't change, right? AC changes completely all the time, like that. So as the world starts to see that AC is more useful, um, he saw a big threat to his company. And uh, he has all his rich friends, including JP Morgan, was one of his uh, greatest friends, closest friend. Um, and uh, they, part they partnered together and 
figured out so many, so many ways to discredit like, uh, Tesla. Oh, Tesla was an um, Austrian-American. He was born in Austria. Um, he was an immigrant, moved to America, um, had a lot of opportunity, invented a lot of things. Um, but uh, there's this huge wealth of funds, of money come, uh, going against him. And, um, and uh, Edison also had so many marketing campaigning against it. Um, the electrocuting elephant is actually one of the um, really brutal things that he did. He, uh, Took, it went on basically campaigning that AC is extremely dangerous. Um, and because with DC, he created all these little uh, batteries, you know, it doesn't seem to hurt anyone. But with AC, you can step it up and down and then it seems very dangerous. So the public was very easy to be convinced that AC was uh, uh, very dangerous um, because they heard of AC killing people, electrocuting people, um, but they never heard of a dry battery <laughs> like this to, uh, killing people. Although if you create a lot of power, you can, right? but that's not being uh, advertised. So. On the streets, uh, he, 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 he went and uh, actually publicly electrocuted elephants in the streets to demonstrate to the people of New York or, or, and America that how dangerous AC can be. So he uses AC and uh, with the help of all his rich friends, it passes a law in the Supreme Court to allow people electrocutions in America to be conducted with AC, although you can do it with DC. Um, so all the electrocutions uh, back then were done in AC and everyone was completely scared of AC. Um, and it still didn't quite work. And they actually hired a, a lot of um, gangsters and mafia um, and actually go and loot and uh, completely destroy Tesla's lab um, and set his lab on fire until a point that he actually almost had to leave America. Um, and at the end, he was so discredited that uh, Tesla died alone um, in some rundown apartment in New York, completely broke. Um, one of the huge tragedy, I think uh, the story of Tesla is one of the um, biggest tragedy uh, in, in uh, the history of science or modern history of science. Um, if you like, uh, there's a documentary called The War of the Currents. Um, uh, you can, or I think there's lots of documentaries about this period. You can look up some of the history in whatever uh, streaming service and Netflix or Curiosity Stream or whatever um, to find out more. Um, it is a very interesting piece of history. I won't go on too long, but um, yeah. Uh, of course, nowadays you recognize uh, which one is more useful. By the way, uh, Edison's idea of, to electrify um, America, his idea was this, because you cannot step it up or down, what you need is in every household, I should put it on this side, and the elephant on this side. In every household, he proposed people would um, buy an Edison General Electric uh, generator. And every part of our house will have our own generator. And as a result, he can sell a lot of these and he can earn a lot of money because of this, right? Um, it, Tesla's idea was to have one central power, power plant to generate electricity. I know, crazy idea. <laughs> generate electricity and step it up and down and transfer it um, to households. Um, free of charge, uh, and Edison was extremely scared of this idea. How on earth are you? Will anyone buy a DC generators after this? His company will go broke if people are used. He cannot imagine how you can make a profit. Maybe he probably would be kinder to Tesla if he found out how to make a profit. Um, nowadays, we found out a way to do that, but he couldn't imagine back then how can you charge people if you were just sending them power? Um, you're creating power over here and sending them that way. Um, that's one of the reasons he was so adamant in um, uh, getting Tesla out of the way, which is a huge shame. Tesla's one of the smartest guys, um, the inventor. Um, he actually tried to, uh, one last thing I promise, <laughs> he tried to make Tesla coils, if you heard of these, in a power plant and completely get rid of power grids and just have coils over here so that you can send power wirelessly to every house in America. If he's still alive, I don't know if he can make that a reality, but you can get Wi-Fi and you basically invented Wi-Fi um, and wireless charging to every household, um, at least the idea of it, uh, before he was able to make that a reality. Um, there's so many inventions, you should look it up and I'm not gonna to, so spend too much time, but it's a great shame that he died. Um, I don't know what age he died, but pretty early because of uh, a lot of disease and stuff um, of this tragic story. All right, um, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed uh, all of this. And now I will go into, help you guys to uh, solve um, some of top, get you prepared with topic test five. I'll go through as much problems as possible. All right, any questions? Okay, good. Okay, so let's see, I have your rankings over here. Um, so I'll sort of start fresh over here. Um, the first one is topic test for question 22. Okay, I'll do, I'll prioritize test five things first. All right, let's, uh, question 20.
Okay, yes, this is a good problem. Um, so uh, here, uh, it's about the velocity selector. So this is about a velocity se selector, and um, part A says sketch the free body diagram for uh, a charge when it goes inside, right? So let's sketch out what this is. So you have a positive plate here, you have a negative plate here, and you have uh, fields going, magnetic fields going into the page like this. And uh, what charge is this? This guy is a positive charge. So you have a positive charge. So when, when it is in the middle of the plate, right, when it's between the plates, what are the forces? So you want to draw a free body diagram on it. First of all, is it in contact with anything? No, all right? So you don't have any contact forces, all right? So you just need to look at non-contact forces. And the only ones you've learned, this is uh, question 20, um, is gravity, electric force, and magnetic force, right? Fg, Fe, Fb. Do you have gravity? Yes, but uh, uh, it tells you to ignore it. Um, good, so you just need to worry about electric and uh, magnetic. So which way are the electric fields going? The electric field is going downwards, right? From positive to negative. So the uh, electric force will point down. And then uh, magnetic force is going into the field and it's moving this way. So you can use, uh, say, I think the quickest is your left hand rule. Um, so imagine the current is now going this way. So your middle finger um, or second finger will be going to the right and then the field is going into the page which way is the force pointing? It's pointing upwards. Okay. That's it. That's the free body diagram. All right. Um, and uh, that will probably be two points or maybe one point. Uh, I don't know, probably two points, uh, one for each. And then um, part B, state the magnitude of each respective force. Well, the magnitude of this is QVB. Technically, uh, we need to look at the angle between V and B as well. So it's sine included angle. But um, the angle between V because it's V cross B, right? So um, just in case you don't know where this comes from, this creates a vector. So the magnitude of the result of this vector is um, V B sine theta. Theta is the included angle. So the V is going this way, the field is going into the page, so they're 90 degrees of each other. So uh, this is 90 degrees, so the whole thing is just one. Right? So that is the magnitude of the B force, and this is the magnitude of the E force. It says in term, um, Oh, maybe I should specify in terms of E and B. Yeah, I put it in the I put it in the sec third part, but not in the second part. Okay, what is the requirement on the speed in terms of E and B? Should it go through slit two? So if it needs to be able to go through slit two, it needs to be able to travel in a straight line, which means there should be no net force going either up or down. So this must be balancing this, and I've derived this in class already. So what you need is you need the magnitude of Fb to equals the magnitude of Fe. So you need this, right? And that means you need V to be, um, to equals to the velocity to uh, be um, exactly the ratio of the field strength, the electric field strength to the magnetic field strength. You don't need these two steps to derive it to get a full point. I, I will probably write it uh, because unless you memorize this out of <laughs> uh, memory, but otherwise um, this is how you uh, will answer the problem. I, I won't commit this to memory, honestly, because it's hard to remember which one's on top, which one's on the bottom. And then part B, it says, if the charge have a speed larger than, notice this is a bit tricky, flip it around, um, larger than the value B over E, what will happen? Well, um, so if V is larger than B over, as a value larger than B over E, then um, that is a typo, I think. Yeah, it should be E over B. Sorry, maybe that's why it confuses people. <laughs> Sorry, that's a typo. Yeah, uh, it should be asking for E over B. Yeah, um, right, I'll change that, thanks. Um, so if it's larger than E over B, uh, that means what? That means, well, that means uh, if, if V is equals to E over B, then you see that these two magnitudes are the same, right? Because let's say V is E over B, right? So you'll see that the magnitude of this guy is QE, the magnitude of this guy is QE, so there's no net force. But if it's larger than it, then it means that this will be larger because this depends on velocity. So you have upward force and this guy will, hit, uh, will bend upwards and the reverse is, it will, will make it bend downwards. Any questions? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. So, what if it's negative? Um, then you need to reanalyze this. Um, so, positive plate, negative plate. So, negative go in here. Uh, let's look at the electric force first. Which way will it go? The electric force um, will uh, will be pointing up this time, right? Fe, we're pointing up. 
you can either think of just intuitively, right? Negative will repel and attract to the positive, or you can think of the field lines are going down and negative charges go against the field line, so they go up. The magnetic force is going to uh, be this time, again, you can use your left, Fleming's left hand rule, but this time point your current um, against its actual velocity because um, if a negative charge is flowing this way, it, it's, it's equivalent to a positive charge going the other way, basically. So the current will be pointing the other way, the field lines um, go down, so um, sorry, the field line goes in, so your thumb is now pointing down. So the magnetic force is there, uh, pointing this way. So that's your free body diagram. Uh, the magnitudes are the same. Uh, this is QVB. If you want to emphasize uh, um, that you should plug in the positive uh, um, value here because I'm looking for the magnitude, right? So you can put an absolute value here if you want. Um, and uh, same thing for this. So the absolute value only applies to the Q actually because I've already taken care of the diagram. Remember, we, we've just done the hard work of using our rules or whatever intuition to determine which way it's going. Um, wait, when you're looking at arrows in three dimensions, um, then there is no, uh, when you look at arrows in three dimensions, um, there, there's no sense of positive vectors in three dimensions. You can't say a vector is positive. That doesn't make any sense. Um, in, in just want to dispel this uh, misconception once and for all, because let's say I have a vector um, uh, f, and I, vectors have components, right? Let's say it's plus three minus five. Tell me, is this vector positive or negative? That's a that's a invalid question. <laughs> that's a meaningless question. Well, the first component, the fx component is positive. The fy component is negative. So what do you mean? <laughs> it's, it's no positive or negative. If you ask me the magnitude, well, the magnitude is three square plus minus five square square root. This is always positive. So what do you mean? <laughs> There's no sense of vectors being positive or negative. Or the component can be positive or negative. But right. So um, the magnitude is always positive. The direction you need to use description words like up, down, left, right, uh, into or out of the page. Right? These are the words to describe it. All right, um, and uh, there's a question asked, does the magnetic field always opposes the electric force? Uh, the magnetic force always opposes, not necessary. Um, in this case, it made it so, um, but uh, you could get an, a question with the, with the plates flipped and also the field going the same way. This is a good exercise for yourself, right? Try to analyze, uh, let's start with a positive, which is easier. Try to do this yourself, right? So try to draw a free body diagram like this. You can create variations yourself on the test. Um, so if it's moving this way, so this is the velocity, this time I'll quick do this quickly. Which way is the electric force? Well, the electric force is going to go this way. Right. Remember, free body diagrams always start with drawing it from the center of mass of the object. And then uh, the magnetic force is, um, this is the same as the first case, but just to double check, the current goes this way, field goes in, so the magnetic force this time goes up. So you actually have a net force going up, but this doesn't work as, so this is a completely legitimate question, uh, short answer question, it's completely legitimate, but it's not a practical application because now you will get a net force, right? So your F net is FB plus FE in the upwards direction. Um, so you always bend the particle upwards. So it's not doing a good job in selecting the velocity uh, out of it. So it doesn't work as a velocity selector. It might work in other applications, by the way. Yeah, so it's completely possible. Um, if probably you won't get one, but if, if you, if you um, do get gravity as well, um, if you do need to uh, probably, you know, in, in this test or exam, you're not gonna include gravity, but if you do, you know, it's not a difficult problem. You just add that up, right? So the net force in this case is, uh, in the upwards direction, is uh, QVB plus QE, magnitude of that, magnitude of that, plus MG, like that. So this is the total, mi sorry, minus, because, the gravitational force is pointing down. So um, in principle, uh, if, if you get an advanced question, right, you, you, can, you can ask, uh, what's, what's the net force in Newtons? Um, and I give you the charge, I give you the mass, I give you the velocity, and I give you the EMP fields. And uh, you can just plug this in and you can uh, get however many Newton is the net force. I can ask you how much acceleration it is, which is the, so you can find out what the acceleration is, et cetera, uh, et cetera right, like that. But uh, you won't get all three together. If D is a positive charge, what was the answer? Or D on the positive charge, what was the answer? So if it's, yeah, I think I answered that. If it's larger, um, yeah, it will bend up. I also had this already solved in the lecture, so you can, you can uh, review that. I think uh, this is also discussed in lecture 17. Right, next problem, question 11. Oh, good. This is a good question. So uh, it's about sketching magnetic field lines. So we have uh, talked about explicitly in class um, uh, about a single wire. Um, but now let's have two together. How would they look like? So first, uh, 
for a single wire going out of uh, into the page like this, the magnetic field is like this. And then which way is you put your thumb in uh, along the direction of current and then they'll tell you, okay, so the B field is going this way. All right, so now what if I have two? So um, you, I mean, if they're independent, that's fine, but now you kind of want to um, put them together. Uh, so you, you need to in, have them interacting um, and see, remember like a dipole in electricity, there's a positive and a negative charge for electric fields. Um, you don't just draw them separately like this. Right? You need to also draw the com com combined effect after that. So at least draw three lines um, usually. So, right. so this is how that would look. All right, so how would this look? The idea is, as you can see, it's like joining the dots. Um, just like here, you're joining up. Um, you, you first draw them locally uh, next to it and then try to, try, to see, try to join them up. So this is uh, similar. Uh, imagine you're drawing it from here. Um, then it will look like this. And this line would get connected here. This line would get connected here. I'll redraw this, don't worry. So very close to the, here, it'll go like a circle, nothing's changed. Very close to here, it's gonna go like a circle. But in the middle, as it tries to go here, um, right? The, if you think of it as a vector, this vector is trying to point down, but this guy is trying to have a vector that's gonna point up. So it's gonna push this up a little bit. But I think the easier way is just to think of connecting the, the lines together like this. might have a better picture for you. Yeah, there you go. Like this. Okay. So you see um, here, the direction should be going clockwise overall like this. Right. So you, know, you see it's very close to it. It's basically a circle because the, when it's very close to it, which one is stronger? The, the, um, this one is gonna be stronger. So it, uh, it's basically, this guy's effect is gonna be very weak. You can't see it. Um, it, this, this is a good diagram. They actually skew it a little bit, but I mean, when we're grading, it won't be that um, picky. But uh, yeah, so it's skewed a little bit. So it's a little bit flat. You see, it's like an oval. Um, but if you're very close, it's basically a circle. As you go further out, then uh, you'll need to sort of connect the dots. This guy's going clockwise uh, because mine is uh, into the page and this one's out of the page. So um, use your right hand rule, you'll see that they go like this. Now, if they're opposite directions, um, then uh, you, again, you can try to build this up. So one of them is trying to go this way, nope, the other way, this way, and this guy is going to going out of the page, so it's trying to go this way, right? So um, you basically have like an asymptote over here, and um, and I think it's uh, you 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 you'll see that. Um, at first, it will look like a circle, and then here, when it goes over here, it will um, it will try to get squashed in here. So that's the main idea that they won't cross through each other. Which is, yeah, they're doing a better job at uh, looking through here. So in the middle, um, let's ex let's explain why in the middle it's a straight line. In the uh, in the middle over here, let's pick the points. This point, the magnetic field due to this guy is going to be pointing this way. So the field due to number one is going to be pointing this way. Now the field due to number two is also going to point this way, right, at this point. Okay. So the net effect, B1 plus B2 in this direction, is going to be a big vector pointing this way. Right? So in the middle, you have a field line that is basically going straight down. And uh, let's pick another point over here. What is the effect on the green to here? Well. Um, it's going to point this way. That's that's uh, B due to wire number one. And B due to wire number two is also going to point this way, but it's going to be a smaller arrow like that, okay? Because it's further away from two, from, the, from two over here. So the effect on, so uh, this green arrow should be longer than this green arrow, uh, if I'm being precise. But it, since it just has you to sketch the pattern, uh, you don't have to draw these arrows. So I'm just explaining why it is, um, the way it is. And so the net effect is going to be something like this. And so everything, if you analyze them point by point, that's how, that's how you can build this up. So over here, uh, B1 is gonna be pointing this way. And B2 is going to be, uh, use your right hand to wrap it over here. It's gonna be pointing this way, but at a smaller 
uh, angle because a smaller length because it's further away than B1 is to uh, the source. So this is B2. Right? So the net effect would be something like this. So if, if it is completely a circle, then like if there's no B2, you'll see that this should be, uh, the green should just make a circle, a perfect circle. But because of the presence of uh, wire number two over here, it's going to bend it. Do you see the blue? It is a net effect between here. It's going to bend it a little bit towards this side. I should make the blue a little bit longer. Um, hopefully you understand the point. Right. The, 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 the presence of B2 is going to make it, the net effect a little bit tilted. So the, it's not going to be a perfect circle, but it's going to be squashed, right? If it follows the green, if I just completely follow the green and connect the dots with the, connect all the arrows of the green, it will be a perfect circle. But because of the orange, it's going to be squashed like this. Let's look at the picture again. So you can see that's why it's uh, not a perfect circle, but squashed closer and closer over here. Okay. And then getting the direction right is just um, using your hand rules, right? whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. All right, good. Um, any questions about this? Question 26, someone asked. Let me look at this first. Um, I'll get a few of these with higher votes first and then I'll get to 26. But yeah, thanks for suggesting. So the next question is question 30. Any, any follow up with uh, this one, question 11? This uh, five people voted on this. The next one, there's three people voted on question 31. Okay. Let me know if you have follow up questions. Ah, good, this is a lens law. All right, so let me just mark this. This is question 11. Question 31. All right, so determine the direction of the induced current on, on each case. Very good. Okay, so uh, let's start with A. We have a loop and then we have a current going here, and the current is increasing. Okay, the question is um, so this is an external current, let's label it. And the current is uh, the, the question is um, the induced current, which way is it going, right? So uh, at first, um, what is, I need to know the flux that goes through here. So the flux is the, it's B times A, right? B dot A. Um, so what is the B field that goes through here? Well, there's a current going through here. So use your right hand and you'll see that the, basically there's a magnetic field going in here. And this magnetic field is due to the external current. This is B external. It's it's due to this. It's this guy creating this B field. So on this side, actually, by the way, on this side, it's going to be like this, right? If you wrap your fingers around, you should be able to see that here the B field is going in and here the B field is going out. It's going to wrap around the wire like this. Okay? But we're just focusing on here because we care about the induced current on this side. And also, by the way, um, the strength of the B field is going to be weaker and weaker the further you go out, right? Uh, it's going to be stronger uh, here. Um, according to the formula of, um, it's not, it, the question didn't ask, but it's according to this formula. Sorry. So if the uh, further the distance away, this is the distance, perpendicular distance away from the wire, the, the smaller the B field, the weaker the B field. So this point, the B field is going to be weaker than this point, right? This arrow is going to be shorter than this arrow, but it doesn't matter. Um, the idea is this is increasing. So uh, the, what happens to the flux, increasing or decreasing? You can tell me the flux through here, increasing or decreasing. So we can write out a few steps. Right. So I external increases, which means the flux, anyone? Right. So the B will increase, the B external will increase, which means the flux will increase, right? It's B times A, right? If the flux increase, it, which way does it increase? It increases into the page, right? The wire doesn't want that. It wants to stay the way it is. So it's going to try to create a B field that opposes that increase. So it wants to create an induced B field. Let me use yellow um, to, it will generate its own B field to refuse being increased, okay? So it will, the B induced will increase out of the page. Be induced. Okay, which way does the induced current has to flow uh, in order to generate this? Anyone tell me? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Very good, counterclockwise. So the induced current must, so final step, induced current must be counterclockwise in order to achieve the goal of the yellow B field, the induced B field being that way. Okay, so these are, these are the steps in your head you should go through to answer that. Uh, how do we know a B field on top half 
is into the page and bottom is out of the page. Uh, just to save time, if someone can answer that for me, that would be great. Um, I want to do a decreasing example uh, as well. Let's do C. What do you think of, about C? If I is constant, very good. <laughs> so if I is constant, then the field is constant. Um, uh, oh, yeah, let me write it the screen. So part C, if I is constant, then the B field is constant. Um, that means the flux is constant. Um, that means d b d t is zero, right? This guy does not change with time, right? If it's constant, that means there's no induced EMF. Um, that means there's no induced current. Okay. Notice you can um, you can calculate the magnitude. In order to calculate the magnitude, uh, they will also need to tell you how much resistance uh, the the wire the wire has, uh, because Faraday's law only tell you what, when, even if you even if you know how much b is increasing, right? If you can actually calculate, uh, if you can find the formula. As this as a function of time, you can take the derivative. You will still only get the induced EMF. You need the because current. Remember, I repeat this many many times. Current is the most dependent on what you put in your circuit. So it depends on what the resistance of the whole the net circuit is, and then you can finally determine that. Okay, let's do a decreasing example. Um, what do you think? Let me change part D to decreasing. Shall we do that? Yeah, let's do that. So I'll change part D to decreasing. So so that this time the wire is pointing in. And a different way as well, so to give you some variety. All right, so first let's determine the B field. I'll at this time, I'll go through the same five steps, just quicker, right? So this way it's going in. Let's make the wire going down again. So again, it's a little bit different, give you some variety. So the wire going down, right? So here it's going out of the, the field. Okay, I won't draw too much. But the blue is external, right? It's due to, so determine. Make sure you differentiate what's external, what's internal. Okay, so this guy uh, is decreasing. Okay, so B prime. <laughs> it's a modification of part D. Decreasing. In case anyone reads these notes later. Okay, so the B external is decreasing in strength. Um, in which way? What's the direction? So the magnitude of B is decreasing uh, in a way that is um, out of the page. I always have trouble imagining in and out with these symbols. I always have to think of the arrow. So uh, once I determine it, sometimes I like to put a bracket and just uh, put a, a, a note over here like this. Um, so so uh, like actually put in the English word so it's easy to, uh, instead of looking at a symbol, I always get confused. All right, so it's decreasing in the direction that is out. So this, rem do, do, remember, this is the strength. We're talking about the strength is decreasing. The direction is still pointing out, all right? So differentiate that. Okay. Um, so what's the flux through it? So same idea, right? This flux is going to be decreasing in strength. Um, also the direction, well, I guess the direction of the field is outwards, but technically this is a scalar, it doesn't have direction, but um, you can imagine it that way. Um, the idea is now I need to create, a, I'll change it to yellow, right? I need to, I need to induce something to refuse this change. So it, think of, a, you put your finger sort of coming out of the screen and uh, it is decreasing. So the wire doesn't like it. So what should it do? It should create a B field to increase the strength coming out. Okay. So it must do this because it doesn't like the fact that it's decreasing. Right? It wants to maintain the status quo. Lenz law is basically about inertia. It wants to stay the same inertia. Okay. So we want to induce a B field going out like that. So B induced must be going out. Right? Can you tell me which way must the current flow in order to achieve this. So B induced must be, must increase uh, going out. So the I induced must be counterclockwise. Let me check. Yes, very good. So it must be counterclockwise. Okay. So these are sort of the five steps you go through. All right, good. any questions with this as I move on? Okay. Question 16, let me write out our plan uh, since we're close to the ending time now. So. Uh, question 16 has two votes. Maybe I will do that. And then the next one is uh, question 18. I'm, I'm focusing on uh, practice test five once. Uh, again, there's two votes in that for 18. And then 25, uh, this one doesn't have a label. I don't know which practice test you're talking about, but maybe I think it's five. Um, there's also two votes on that. Um, and then there's a test four, I'll skip that. And then question 21, there's one vote. Um, 20, did I go through 20 already? Yeah, that did 20. Yeah, 20 is done. So that's a redundant one. And then 15, 11, that's done. Okay, looks like that's it. All right. All right, so um, 
you know what, I'll, I'll keep on and I'll, I'll try to go quicker. Uh, 31 was suggested earlier, right? just, uh, just to make sure. Try to um, go through there as quick as possible. Um, not 31, sorry, uh, 26 was suggested. And I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll go through them and keep them in the recording, right? Um, but you feel free to leave. If you do have to leave, uh, thank you very much and hope you have a great night. 24, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> All right, I have to sleep set some time, by the way, but I'll go through some of these. Right. All right, 16. Um, Okay, yeah, this is good. Um, all right, this should be pretty simple. Uh, so 16, you have a uh, plane with the fields. I don't like them uh, marking it as a cross, uh, uh, as a plus sign, I'll change it into crosses. Uh, but you have a proton going through, right? Proton is for positive charge. All right, so this is purely a test of um, using uh, Fleming's left-hand rule or, uh, or the cross product right-hand rule. Right. So, this is going to see if there's anything else. Sorry, experience of force, yeah. All right, so, proton, so, current, so imagine the currents going through this way. So remember, left hand, um, so this is Fleming's left hand rule. Uh, this stands for current, this stands for field, um, and this stands for force. Okay. Uh, so the field goes into the page. So put your index finger into the page, right? first finger into the page. Current is going to the left. So uh, anyone in, um, in the chat, what do you get? What is the force once this guy is in the field? I get pointing down. Okay. Yep, I will post the slide as soon as the lecture ends and also the recording as soon as Zoom gives me the link. Yep. Any for, I, I know uh, in the, in the um, lecture, extra lecture slide, I made some variants on this. Um, uh, yeah, I actually put it here. Is there, any, is there a particular variant you want me to do? Variation D, okay, good, thank you. Uh, if the proton is going into, oh, okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, so if the proton is going, uh, what color should I use? I use just white. If the proton is going into the page as well, it's a little bit hard to draw now. Um, so let me draw this as the proton and then I'll say, this is the velocity that's going into the page. Now they are parallel to the field. So the force would be zero. So it doesn't experience any force if it goes parallel to the field. How do we see that? Remember, go back to the definition. Um, and uh, if this is, uh, there's several ways to know, uh, know, to see this. Um, you can look at the magnitude of that. So the magnitude of Q times the magnitude of V cross B. Uh, all right, let me actually do the step in case you've never seen this before. So the rules is in, in math. Um, if you have a magnitude of everything, you can break it down into the magnitude of something and then the other thing. So this is, V cross B is one scalar, sorry, one vector, right? So you cannot put it in each. Okay. Uh, because this itself produces a vector. So you need to keep these together. But this is a scalar multiplied by it, so you can actually um, split it up like this. All right? So fortunately, this is the charge is a proton, all right? so the magnitude of it is just itself. But uh, just in case it's an electron, um, I'll keep the absolute value sign like this. Right? So this is the magnitude. Right? So what's the magnitude of that? It's VB sine theta included. Right? So if V and B are parallel, the included angle is going to be zero. So that's why sine zero is zero and you'll get a big fat zero like this. So whether this is an electron or a proton, it doesn't matter. It, it only experiences magnetic force if V is not parallel to B or anti-parallel to B. So if V is at an angle to B, actually the, the theory is you should split the V into its parallel component and its perpendicular component. And only the perpendicular component is going to contribute to a force. Um, let's say in this diagram, which way would the force point? So let me use the right-hand cross product rule this time. So you put your palm uh, toward, you point your fingers towards B first. Um, in this case, it's, that, uh, it's at an angle. And try to wrap your hand towards B. But if you put your hand like slap on your screen like this, you, you'll break your hand if you try to wrap it backwards. So the uh, only way is you flip your thumb back towards the screen. And now you can actually have a chance to wrap your hand from B to B, or your right hand from B to B like that, right? So, and you, you know that the, the F must always, the force must always be perpendicular to both of the inputs. Right? So this is a feature of cross products. The output is always perpendicular to both of the inputs. So as a result, if the input uh, B and B lies on the screen, there's only two options for F, it either comes out or in, okay? So uh, you, your thumb will either point out of the screen or into the screen. Just see which way does it make your right hand uh, easier to wrap from B to B, all right? So from B to B, it's going in, so the force is going to be pointing uh, into the page. So the force is going to point 
into the page, right? And uh, if this is the um, included angle, you see that this part contributes to it, right? So it's uh, the magnitude of V times sine theta, right? So this length is, is this. So as you, that's why this is the part, V sine theta is the perpendicular part that contributes to the magnetic force. And that's why this is a good use of cross products. Okay, any questions? Good, all right. Yeah, uh, it's not a multiple choice option, <laughs> sorry. Uh, next, um, question 18, all right, I think I'll be able to do it quickly uh, since the answer is there already. So again, Fleming's left hand row, uh, which, what is it asking? It's determining the direction of the current, good. Okay, this time it's sort of reverse engineering. It tells you, so use this, I'll just keep it here, use this, but uh, you're given the force, usually we find the force last, you're giving the other two, but this time it asks you to find the current. So put, um, point your force uh, upwards and then the field from right to left, right? And then your middle finger should be uh, pointing sort of inside the, into the page that way. Okay. Any questions for this? All right, next, question 25. Uh -huh, this is a, not a good one. Um, so you have uh, straight wires pointing out to distance d apart, right? So let's sketch that out first. Question 25. So you have a wire here, you have a wire here. Let's call them I1 and I2. Actually, they both have the same current. But uh, I'm going to draw magnetic field vector, so I want to differentiate which is one, which is two. And then you have three points here. Each of them is uh, d over four. Right? The whole thing is uh, distance d apart. Okay. All right, location. All right, that's a bad idea. Uh, I'll call the locations one, two, three. I'll call the currents A and B. All right. So you want to find the net magnetic field, magnitude and direction at each of the points. Um, let's do number one first, All right? So uh, due to wire number one, again, dot means coming out, right? So let me make my life slightly easier out of the page. Um, so due to number, due to wire A, it's gonna produce a field going this way. Due to wire B, it's gonna produce a field uh, going, use your right hand again, right? At, at point number one, it's gonna produce a field going this way. Now, which arrow should be longer? Should arrow A be longer or B be longer? Good, A should be longer. Okay, uh, this is B due to wire B. Okay, um, so yeah, so, that, so, so the net, um, and then we have a rule, right? We, we have the formula for this. Right? And so the B net is going to, we know it's going to be to the right because of, uh, the magnetic field due to wire A is going to be stronger, so this is going to win. So let's make it B A minus B B. All right. So mu not um, two pi is common. I'll skip a few steps. So I just need the current A over the distance A minus the current B over the distance B. Actually, the currents are the same, so let me pull that out as well. So just one over distance uh, from A. If I have time, I'll color code this. But, uh, that's fine. Um, and uh, the distance of B. So what is the distance from A? Well, it's D over four. What's the distance from B to point one? The, and it's three D over four. Okay, okay. and then the rest is uh, algebra, as they say. So let me, I, I hate three level fractions, so let's flip, the, flip this up. So it's four over D minus four over three D. How do I do this? Let's multiply a three and a three, right? So now I have a common factor over here. Um, so I have mu naught i over two pi. Three d is a common factor. On top, I have three times four minus four. Um, so just two times four, right? So that's eight. Okay, and that's the result. Uh, if you like, you can clean up this a little bit. Four mu naught i over three pi. Did I get it right? Four mu naught i over three pi d, sorry. <laughs> forgot about the D. And direction is to the right magnitude here. Um, I think you can understand the last one. And uh, let me, yeah, any follow-up questions? For, for, for two, they're equal distance. So even without doing the math, I, I know that the, um, the strength will, will be equal because they have equal distance away and the current is the same, right? So they'll just balance into zero like that at point number two. 
Any follow-up questions with this? I'll give five seconds before I move on. Okay, no, all right, 21. Okay, is, is there a particular variation you want me to do? Top left, top right, bottom left, uh, bottom right? While I write out the question. It's asking for the magnetic force felt by one of these particles, or do you want me to do more than one? Let me know. So this is the current. Bottom left, all right, good. So this is the velocity. So first, um, I want to find a magnetic force. If you are unsure, write, it, write out the formula first. Okay, so that I want the magnetic force on a particle, you use this formula. If you want the magnetic force on a wire, on a particle, right, particle, on a particle Q, on a charge Q, if you want it on a wire, use this. Okay, so this time I need to use this, okay. This is it appropriate here. So what do I need? I need the charge, I need the velocity, and I need the B field. So let's do one at a time. I have the velocity, good, done. That's two third, one third done. Um, I need the B. So what B here is the external B field that this guy is experiencing, it's whether the wire experiences or the particle experience. So the B field here is due to the extra current that's moving here. So the current generates a B field around it. And um, this guy will have a B field going into the page, right, on this side, if you wrap your right hand around it. So the B is going into the page. Now do a cross product. Let's use our right hand. Do a cross product with V cross B. So V is pointing to the left of the screen. So put your right hand pointing to the left of the screen and try to wrap your hand. Um, so B is, uh, I hate the cross notation. So uh, this is into the page, right? So wrap your hand into the page after pointing to the left, all right? So it looks like the easiest way is that way when you have the force, uh, when you have the result of V cross B pointing down, okay? All right, so V cross B is pointing down, but that's not the final answer as you see, there is a Q over here, right? So let's differentiate this clearly. So V, notice I'm not writing F, I'm writing V cross B is pointing down. But the vector F is negative some magnitude times this direction. Whenever you have a negative number here, multiply by a vector, that flips the vector. So if the vector, uh, vector C points this way, negative C is the same vector pointing the opposite direction, right? So what is negative? A number of this. So FB is proportional to negative of this, which means it has to be pointing up. So this is the direction of F. It might not be the same length, and it, sh it shouldn't be actually, because uh, it should be multiplied by Q, right? Uh, but like, you know, the, we, won't, we, won't, um, we won't be picky about these lengths, but it, you will potentially have a different length. So this part, the orange is just purely the mathematics of V cross B. Now you have to take into account of the physics that this guy is a negative, okay? Right. Notice this is not looking at the magnitude. Um, I only take val absolute values of things if I'm interested in magnitude. If I'm interested in direction, which I am now, then I cannot. Okay. Any other variations or any other follow-up questions on this? Top left, all right, yeah. So the magnetic field, same thing. Uh, we're gonna use this, right? So top left, um, let's draw the particle. Let's, let's repeat this here, positive, going this way. All right, so I already have V. Now I just need B, so let me change it to blue. Um, so it's going out of the page here. So B is going out. Again, I like to write it out. All right, so good. Let's see, use our right hand again. So right hand pointing to the right of the screen, and you want to wrap your fingers out of the page, right? V cross B. So which way is V cross B pointing? I'm going to hurt myself, unless I twist it this way. Um, <laughs> uh, so you want to point, wrap your hands out of the screen. So I got my thumb pointing downwards. So I have V cross B being pointed downwards and this is a positive charge. Good, that means that F is going to be proportional, not oppositely proportional, but directly proportional to the V cross B direction like that. You can also use Fleming's left hand rule, by the way, um, just to check over here. Uh, Fleming's left hand rule say that you need to point your index fingers in a field, right? So the field is into the page, so point your index finger into the page. I uh, have a current, so the charge is moving this way, but it's negative, so the, the, the conventional current, right? The conventional current is the flow of positive charge. So th think of it uh, going to the right, and now you get your force going up. Your thumb should be going up nicely. Right? So that will work. You can double check with this as well. This time the current is just going this way, feel this out, and your thumb is going down. Okay. So learn both ways because uh, Fleming's left hand rule is good for all the magnetic force stuff, um, but it doesn't benefit you into 3C or other <laughs> fields, right? The, the cross product um, is, uh, and, and if you learn both in an exam, you can always double check. So that's good, it'll give you an extra thing. Double check. All right, good. Any uh, follow up here? No, I'll move on. Okay, so 15. Okay, good. So this is, and, uh, is there a particular variation you want me to do? A, B, or C while I write out the problem?
and I need to find uh, which direction the wire would move. Okay, direction, which means basically the force on the wire. Part D, okay, good. D is asking flipping both, all right. So we'll flip this, flip this, and flip this. North, south. So I'm doing D. Okay, all right, so force on a wire. This time we use the uh, variation of this, right? Okay, so what is the L vector? L vector is just the direction of the current. So this should go this way. I'm gonna use the cross, right, right hand cross product rule. Um, and I need a B field, so let's draw the B field is going from north to south. All right, so now let's use our right hand pointing towards the current, so to the right of the screen, and then wrap your hand downwards. I get my thumb pointing into the screen. So the force is going to be into the screen. Any questions on that? All right, good. And where are we? Okay, almost there. 26 is good. Okay, so we have four uh, wires this time and we want to find, uh, which variation do you want me to do? Uh, very, uh, A or B? I want to find, uh, label all the fields from each source. All right, good. Let me know A or B if whoever asked this. B, okay. So we want to find the net field in the middle. Let's call them one, two, three, and four. Yeah, that's the same as what they called it, good. All right, so start with one at a time. Let's start with this wire. Uh, cross means, um, hopefully it's not just me that finds the cross and dot confusing. I always have to think of an arrow, so uh, cross goes into, all right, and then so I'll just label everything first into and out of. Okay. All right, so into, um, again, field due to wire. Uh, so the wire is a source which creates a magnetic field. Right, so point yourself in your thumb into uh, along the wire, and that means it's generating, it's generating field lines like this, right? So these are the field lines due to number one with this direction. So at this point, this is the magnetic field right, at this point due to one. And then uh, let's do number two. And this guy, again, we know that the field lines, magnetic field lines are going to be circular around the wire. So now it's, what's just left is to find the direction. What's just left to do is to find the direction, whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, so you can use your rule again. I'm going to cheat and know that if this guy is clockwise, this guy has to be counterclockwise. But you can uh, verify, don't, don't, don't trust that too much. You know, verify it with your right hand, but it's a good double check. <laughs> if one of them is one way, the other has to be the other way. Right, so this guy's going to, at this point, it's going to be tangent to the field lines, right? So that the relationship between uh, field vectors and field vectors uh, and magnetic field lines, same as electric field vectors and electric field lines, the lines tells you, the tangent of the line tells you the direction of the vector at that point. So this is B2. Um, let's use green for three. So we'll get field lines like this, right? And uh, the direction of this is, um, out, so it's going this way. So at this point, it's going to point this way. B3, I think you get the idea. And um, last one uh, with here, with the orange, I'm not gonna draw all the circles, um, but this is going into, so it should be pointing this way. And if they are the same magnetic field strength, they will all cancel. So these are currents due to wire, and due to wire source is mu naught i over two pi uh, the distance, perpendicular distance. So since they have the same distance, and this, if, if they have the same y, uh, current, which is not, oh, it is specified they have the same. So the net field here is gonna be actually zero. Did they ask? No, let's just find the direction. Yeah, just the individual one. But in case they ask, they will probably all cancel because B4 cancels B1, B2 cancels B3. Okay, good, any questions? All right, last one is question 24. All right, good. Uh, any particular variation? I can probably do all three, but any, any variation you want me to focus on first? So I have a wire out here, a point C, point D somewhere here, point E somewhere here. Right. I'll start with the first one, no one suggests. So the, again, draw your, um, draw your, magnetic field lines around this. 
you know that they are concentric circles. around it like this, All right? It gets weaker and weaker the further you go away. Uh, now, what's just left is the direction. This guy's going uh, out of the page, out of the page, yes. So with your right hand, you can tell that uh, these magnetic field lines are going this way. Remember, just sometimes um, put yourself back in the physics of things. What you're really solving is if you put a compass over here around it, it will point this way. The, the north-south compass would, would point this way. You know, so these are what these abstract looking blue lines really mean in real life, okay? All right, so C it's, is, this is going to be very easy uh, once you understand this, right? So the B at C, at C, yeah, C is going to point pointing that way. The B at E is, good. you just need to draw a tangent to the line. Since E is a little bit lower, right? So it's not, if E is here, it's going to be directly up. But if it's a little lower, just, just make sure it's a tangent to there. So B at E due to I. Remember, it's always at a point due to a source. Right? The, um, this is what fields are. Even for electric fields, it's the same idea. It's always at a point due to whatever source it, it is. And finally, D is this. Okay, any questions? Due to that. All right. Thank you so much. Um, hope this is all good. Uh, and I have nothing else to say other than wish you guys all the best. And I hope to see you guys tomorrow as well. Um, and uh, we'll do more of a lot, uh, there's a lot of vote in problems. And uh, in the beginning of tomorrow, I also want to do a, a quick review of, um, of the topics. I, what, okay, I'll tell you what I plan to do um, is I want to go through the syllabus and identify maybe just no more than 30 minutes. I will tell you what, what are the things on top of my mind that I think um, is important in each of these. And then the next hour, uh, I'll focus on solving problems for you guys, all right? So for example, just as an example, um, for chapter one, I'll tell you, for example, you need to know how to use the buoyancy force formula, B equals rho VG, um, and, uh, and uh, density, the definition of density, um, which is uh, mass per unit volume, okay? And then I'll move on here. The only, the key thing is to learn the hydrostatic equation. That's the key thing. And then maybe mechanical advantage formula. So I'll just go through this one by one, I'll write them out. Um, does that seem like a good idea? It seems like a good idea in my head, so I just want to see your feedback as well. I want to make that helpful for you guys. All right, good. So in the first 30 minutes, I'll probably go through the, all of this big chunk like that, and then in the next uh, hour, I'll um, go to all your open polls and solve those problems. All right, thank you very much. Have a good night. Um, good luck tomorrow. See you guys tomorrow. Bye.